Can I begin by welcoming everybody here, apologising to those standing around the side of the hall that we haven't got enough uh, seats for everybody to sit on, uh, to acknowledge in particular uh, all of my parliamentary colleagues and particularly those uh, wild Westies that you saw up on the stage a moment ago. Uh, Labor's going to win those seats. I'd also like to acknowledge my wife, Mary, and uh, she's got to put up with a lot, you can understand that, uh, and also acknowledge my father somewhere in the audience that turns 90 in about six weeks' time. And I'll have you know he's voted Labour every election since Michael Joseph Savage in, uh, in the 1930s. Ladies and gentlemen, today I want to talk about how Labour is going to grow an export economy that helps New Zealanders get ahead with higher incomes and better jobs. You know, the New Zealand that I grew up in shaped a Kiwi dream. It was a New Zealand where we had one of the highest standards of living in the world. It was a New Zealand where everyone could get a job. It was a New Zealand where you could look forward to high quality education services and health care without, without worrying about the ability to pay. And it was a New Zealand where most New Zealanders had the aspiration and could achieve the goal of owning their own homes. New Zealand is a good country to live in. And because I am proud of it, I want to see it achieve as much as it is able to achieve. And Labor's commitment here today will be to once again ensure that we realise the Kiwi dream. Because too many New Zealanders today are being denied that opportunity. For many New Zealanders, the Kiwi dream is being lost. You know, unemployment is up 50,000 people since the last election. A statistic, but a statistic that represents 68 people a day losing their jobs, 68 families losing a breadwinner. We're going backwards, and that's not good enough for the country that I believe in. Prices are rising faster than wages. Families on Main Street are being squeezed. Their living standards are going backwards. They're getting squeezed because our economy is stagnating and the national government is doing nothing to grow the economy and to grow incomes. And I want to give you a very typical example, and I'll call them Matt and Lisa. Matt's a foreman. He earns about $45,000 a year. His wife, Lisa, is a receptionist. Her income is $25,000 a year. That gives them a household income on about the, the national average. You know, they were looking forward to the promised tax cuts, but they didn't expect that they'd be paying for them through GST going up and higher government charges. When John Key said before the election, quote, national will not be increasing GST, end quote, you know they believed him. He broke that promise and the price rises that were released last week for the last quarter were the highest price rises in 21 years. Now there was the so-called tax switch. Yep, Matt got $26 a week and Lisa, she picked up $12.75. But I've got to say, all of that was swallowed up by higher government charges, the GST increase and by rising prices. They rent an average sort of a home in Auckland. They pay $430 a week. 
and their rent went up also on average last year by $16 a week. They'd love to own their own home. But with costs going up, it's hard for them even to think about saving a deposit. When they put petrol in the car, it now costs them 40 cents a litre more than this time last year. Another 12 bucks to fill up the tank. And what's more, they'll be paying $32 more than they paid last year to register their car. Now here's something that gets very personal. Matt rides a motorbike. It's a cheap way, he thought, to get to work. And the registration on that went up by a huge $174 this year because of government-imposed increases in ACC. And when they go to the supermarket, and you'll know this, it costs a lot more. Two litres of milk, up 70 cents a litre. And Matt and Lisa want to know why it costs so much to buy something that we produce in this country when the New Zealand consumer is paying more than someone in London or someone in Sydney? And that's a question the government should answer. And then there's the block of cheese. Remember that from the last election? John Key and the block of cheese. Well, in the last year, that block of cheese has gone up in price 20% from $12 to around $14. But next week, there's a, there's a really bad shock in store for Matt and Lisa. They struggle each week. They've got a four-year-old daughter. She goes to childcare. And on the 1st of February next week, her childcare fees will go up by $25 a week because the National Party has withdrawn the co-payments towards that to a large degree. $25 a week. You know what that means for a lot of our families that are struggling to make ends meet? It means they can't afford to get their kids to quality early childhood education. And that's where the foundation is laid, and that's a disgrace as well. Matt and Lisa have been forgotten about by this national government. I can assure them they won't be by my government. They weren't a priority for tax cuts, and anything that they did get has already been eaten up by price rises. But not everybody's uh, finding it tough. You know, some did OK out of those tax cuts. Up on Easy Street, half of the tax cuts went to the top 12% of income earners. And cabinet ministers weren't modest with themselves or with me. They and I got $213 extra a week. You think that's pretty good? There's 700 New Zealanders who earn more than a million dollars a year. Earn more than a million dollars a year. And you know what they got? They got over $1,000 a week, and some of them several thousand dollars. So don't tell me it wasn't a case of not having the money. It was a case of who the money went to. And the less you needed, the more you got under this government, and that's a disgrace. It's no wonder that Matt and Lisa are feeling the squeeze. Labor's been thinking a lot about what we can do to make sure Matt and Lisa are a priority again. And we'll do that by making sure that middle and low income New Zealanders are put at the centre of what we do. This starts today by releasing Labor's action plan for jobs and growth. I'll give you an idea of what that's about tax changes that will better support exports and not speculation. Increasing innovation to grow productivity and smart and successful businesses. Boosting skills and training for trades. Owning our own future by increasing savings stopping the asset sales that this government is planning and keeping Kiwi land in Kiwi hands. 
and, as I've announced already, changing our monetary policy to support exports and jobs. In the tax area, I've already announced that we will axe the GST on fresh fruit and vegetables. <laughs> Not just the 2.5% incre increase, but the whole 15% tax. And that will help make a difference in the weekly shopping bill. But more than that, more than that, studies show that the best way to get people to eat more healthy food is to drop the price of it. And we live, and we live in a country that has been found by the OECD to be the third most obese country in the world. And what shocked me is that one child in four at age five is already overweight. And I say as long as it costs more to buy healthy foods than it does to buy junk food, we won't address that particular problem, but Labor will. It will do that by reducing the GST. <laughs> Secondly, I want to announce today policy work underway to overhaul the tax system to make it fairer and more effective for our economy. I'm setting two goals. The first one is about fairness, a tax system that is fair for everyone. The second is a tax system that will actually encourage growth and jobs. And how will we pay for that? First of all, it'll be by dealing with the loopholes that allow too many people to bludge by dodging their taxation. And secondly, it'll be about making sure that everybody pays their fair share. And I'm sorry, some of those that got the fantastic increases in income through the tax cuts last October are going to have to give some of that back. <laughs> what I will guarantee in this is that our tax structure will be fair on everybody, whether you live on Struggle Street, Main Street, or Easy Street. How are we going to change it? In New Zealand, we pay income tax on the very first dollar that we earn. And under Labor, we're going to change that. What I want to announce today is that Labor will introduce a tax-free zone in our first budget and look to increase it during our first term. You know, the Aussies don't always get it wrong. In Australia, on the first $6,000, you pay no tax. And if you earn a really high income, you pay a whole lot more tax. And they've got it right, and I believe that we need to follow that example. <laughs> My goal is to make the first $5,000 that everyone earns tax-free. That is, you would not pay tax on the first $100 a week that you earned. And you know, for a working couple like Matt and Lisa, that would give them an extra take-home pay of $1,000 a year. Why am I advocating this? Well, firstly, I think it's fair. Everybody gets the same, whether you're single or married, whether you're on a low, middle or high income. It's simple. It's also fair. It'll reduce the squeeze on middle income families and it'll really help out those who are on low incomes. What a tax-free zone does is help families struggling to make ends meet have the ability to decide how they're going to spend that extra income. It's not about nanny state. Every one of those families know where their priorities are when they sit around the kitchen table and wonder how they're going to pay for the bills. Matt and Lisa, for example, might spend it on necessities for their children, on clothing or food, but it'll leave something after that for other priorities. And as I said before, Matt and Lisa would dearly love to own their own home. If they could save another $1,000 a year, that would bring them closer to the Kiwi dream of having their own home. 
and God knows they need it. You saw in the paper earlier this week a survey that was done of housing costs around the world. You know it placed New Zealand as one of the most expensive countries in the world to buy your own home. One of the most expensive. And it came as a shock to most of us to know that it's actually more affordable to buy a home in New York than it is to get one in Auckland. And that's not right, and we have to change it. A tax-free zone is a good idea, but we know that we've got to work out how you would pay for that, because you don't get something for nothing. I won't make any promise that I can't keep and that the country cannot afford. So I want to explain some of the options that we're exploring to meet the cost of doing what I think every New Zealander would believe is a good idea. But first I'll tell you how we're not going to pay for it. We're not going to borrow to pay for these tax cuts. <laughs> National's doing that already, to pay for the tax cuts that went disproportionately to the top income earners they are borrowing a net $120 million a week. $120 million a week more into debt. Now maybe they feel they can afford to do that because one of the legacies that Labor and Michael Cullen left this government was a net zero government debt. In the good times, we paid down that debt to leave New Zealand in the black, not in the red. National has borrowed, and the cost of giving those tax cuts to high-income earners will be paid for by future generations. Secondly, Labor will not be increasing GST to pay for this new tax system. Now, you can believe those words from us in the way that you shouldn't have believed those words from them, but if you have any doubts, have a look at what the right-wing bloggers and the right-wing economists are saying to National. Put it up to 17.5%. I think Don Brash wants it at 20%, and I'm telling you, you can't trust a National government. The third thing we won't do, the third thing we won't do to pay for this is to sell off assets. But I can tell you that National would. Remember when they said they will not sell assets in this term? What do you think that means? What do you think that means? I tell you what, they'll be selling the family silver to pay for those tax cuts. They'll be selling the public assets, including our power companies, and Labor will not be doing that. You know and I know that we don't need more Kiwi assets to be hocked off overseas. Labor's going to be more fiscally responsible than national, so before we introduce a tax-free zone, we'll show you how we're going to pay for it. And I mentioned it before, the first area we're going to look at is the question of tax evasion and avoidance. Nobody knows exactly how much that is, but the figure is generally put into the billions of dollars. The tax working group that National set up pointed out that only about half of the wealthiest individuals in New Zealand actually pay the top tax rate. Chances are you're paying a higher tax rate than many of the people out there earning millions. The tax working group also said that when you've got wealth, you can restructure your affairs through trusts and through companies to shelter income from taxes and even actually to get social support that you're not entitled to. That's wrong. The tax working group pointed out that we have $200 billion worth of rental property in New Zealand. And you know how much tax return that gives? Zero. Zero. Actually, it generates tax losses that people claim against. And what I'm saying is that an incoming Labor government, as its first priority, will be to set up a high-powered anti-avoidance tax task force 
entrusted with the role of closing those loopholes. Now, I want to give you one example of the sort of loophole that we'll be closing. Let's say Mark, who lives in Auckland and earns a good salary, also speculates in property investment. He actually arranges to run his rental properties at a loss, $40,000 a year. He can offset that loss against other unrelated income that he earns, so effectively he pays no tax on his first $40,000. And when he sells that property, he pays no tax on the profit that he earns, even though he's written off through a lifetime large amounts of his income tax against the profit that he's made. The Treasury, in March last year, told a national government that it was losing $260 million a year in income through leaving that loophole open. And I tell you, that loophole is still there, but it won't be under a Labor government. You know, I suppose it is a government responsibility because people will try on a system if they can get away with it. But I'd have this to say to Mark. He may be deliberately avoiding his share of tax, but he still expects everybody else, everybody here, to pay their tax so his kids can go to school, so his family can go to hospital if they need to, and so we can provide the services like policing and justice across the country. That is unfair. That's got to stop. If you bludge by dodging your taxes in that way, you're simply passing the burden on to the rest of your community, and we'll stop that. Now, I want to say that might be unfair, but it's also bad for the economy, because what it does is it encourages investment and savings to be channeled into speculative areas that don't grow the economy. And also, that's what's responsible for pushing up house prices so people like Matt and Lisa can't afford to buy a home of their own. If you allow investment and actually encourage investment to go into speculative areas, that's at the expense of the productive export economy. And actually, the productive economy is the area that we need the investment to go in to create higher economic growth, to create better real incomes, and to create jobs. We need to reward people who build the economy rather than those people who make money out of creating absolutely nothing. And that's what a Labor government that I lead will be doing. The second source of funds to allow us to create a tax-free zone will be to claim back some of the windfall tax cuts from the very top income earners. We haven't yet set what a top tax rate would be, and nor indeed have we determined the level of income that it would apply to. But I want to make this very clear to you today, that it will be set at a level that is comfortably into six figures on a personal income and it will be indexed to ensure that no middle-income earner will be paying that top tax rate. We'll make sure that the top income earners don't use trusts to avoid paying the tax rate that they should be paying. That's a big loophole, and we're looking with real interest at the report that the Law Commission is preparing in this area. How big we can make that tax-free zone will depend on how much we can get back by making the tax system fairer and by closing the loopholes. Now, that'll be very popular amongst a lot of New Zealanders, but there are vested interests out there that I can guarantee by tomorrow will be coming after me saying that this is a terrible thing to do. You'll be hearing howls of protest from those who have done well out of dodging their share of the tax 
and who got that enormous windfall last year. But I make absolutely no apology for what I am proposing because it's time we gave a break to the middle-income people who are working hard and to the low-income people who have really been crushed by rising prices, and that is what a Labor government <laughs> believes in. You know, with respect to uh, the well-known quote from Winston Churchill, perhaps we could amend it to say, never has so much been given to so few as this nationalist govern, government has done in the tax system. You know, unless we take steps like this, the gap between rich and poor in New Zealand will continue to grow. It worries me, as a New Zealander, to see the development of two New Zealands, because I believe that has costs social and economic for all of us. Tax changes alone won't be enough if we're going to give everybody a shot at achieving the Kiwi dream. We need to grow new jobs and higher incomes for New Zealand. So what I want to finish on today is how we can accelerate our growth rate and grow an export-led economy. And our pledges as a Labor government to work with the private sector to create a clever, high-value, high-skill, high-tech and high-wage economy. Because we will never get to the top of the world by trying to be cheaper than others. We'll get there by being smarter than others, and that's what our sights are set on. It's a real tragedy that the first area that National targeted for cuts was research and development because research and development is absolutely fundamental to growing our income. We've got to unleash more of our potential, especially in the so-called clean tech area, so we can sell some great ideas to the world. Let me give you one example of a company that David Shearer and I went to see. It's called Lancetech, set up by a couple of scientists who found that they could take the exhaust emissions from steel mills, stop the pollution, and turn that pollution into ethanol. That's a fantastic invention, and they've patented it. For China, if half of the steel mills actually did that, that would produce one-fifth of China's liquid fuel needs. It could be worth billions of dollars. It's called clean technology, and if we're going to unleash our potential, clean tech winners need to benefit from research and development that is done in this country. Our businesses spend only half of 1% of GDP on research and development. The average of other developed countries is three times that level. The evidence is overwhelming that their R&D spending is helping them grow faster, and it's a key reason why we have been falling behind. So we need a lot more companies like Lancetec, and companies in another fast-growing, high-tech area, the health market, companies like Fisher & Paykel Healthcare and Orion Healthcare. They're successful, they're fast-growing, and they show, they're showing now that we can do it. Price Waterhouse Coopers have calculated that our share of the fastest growing area in the world, clean tech, could be anywhere between seven and a half billion and $22 billion a year. That is a vision that we have to realise. It's a vision that we can realise and it builds on our 100% pure branding. The government has ignored that, but Labor won't. I want to talk about skills, and I want to start with a fairly shocking statistic. I found out that one in two of Māori and Pacifica teenage girls leaving school go into unemployment. One in two, and for the boys, the figure 
is more than one in three. And I want to say we can't afford a lost generation. We can't afford to have our young people migrate from underachievement to unemployment to social offending. That costs them dearly, but it costs all of us, and that is something that this country will not tolerate under a Labour government. You know, in the cuts last year, it's a bloody disgrace that the national government cut $50 million out of skilled training when half of our young school leavers in those communities are going into unemployment. <laughs> Putting our young people on the scrap heap of unemployment without motivation and without hope is a social disaster for all of us. There should only be two options for school leavers, going on to earning or going on to learning, and that's why Labor will be putting the emphasis on skill training and trade training to deal with that problem. <laughs> Savings is important because that will be what builds our economy, not by selling off more of New Zealand. Labor supports savings, National doesn't. We ran budget surpluses, they're borrowing to pay for tax cuts. We bought in KiwiSaver and they gutted it. We bought in the New Zealand superannuation scheme and they've stopped contributing to it. Our economy needs more savings to grow and to ensure that we actually own our own future and we'll be making an announcement uh, further on this year on our plans in this area. In monetary policy, I've previously announced that we'll be changing the way monetary policy works, again to make sure that we strengthen rather than undermine our productive export sector. But what all of these things have in common is that it's about having a government that doesn't sit on its hands and do nothing and wait for better prices in the world economy to pull them out of their situation. It's about having a government that is hands-on and active and works with the private sector. It's about a government with real vision and real plans, not gimmicks like cycleways and mining in our national parks. You know, somebody ought to ask Mr Key how many of those 4,000 jobs in cycleways have been created. You want to know what the answer is? 200. 200. Two years on and 200 jobs. And we've got 150,000 people out of work. National strategy relied on tax cuts for the wealthy, but clearly that's not working. Two years after the so-called job summit, we've got a third more unemployment than we had at that time. Labor is going to work with industry so that we grow quickly, sell more to the world, and bring jobs home. So what have I talked about today? I've talked about a tax policy that supports exports, not speculation. I've talked about innovation and clean tech, about skills, about savings, about a supportive monetary policy and active government. These are the foundations of Labor's active alternative. Our ideas will be bold, they'll be prudent, they'll be credible, and they'll be capable of creating growth in high-value-added, high-skill, high-tech and high-wage jobs. And we'll tackle the long-term problems that New Zealand faces rather than sweep them under the carpet. We'll get stuck in with industry to create jobs. We'll take the pressure of families by removing the GST on fresh fruit and veggies and bringing in a fairer tax system. The New Zealand that I believe in and that Labor will deliver is one where everyone pulls their weight, everyone pays their fair share, and in return, everyone gets a fair go. Our priorities will reflect the real needs of New Zealanders for better incomes and more jobs. I want one New Zealand 
not a country divided increasingly by the gap between rich and poor. And I want to ensure that your children and my children have the chances that we had to realise the Kiwi dream. Thank you very much for being here today.